Hey Saints fans, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at Carl Granderson, your best defensive lineman in 2023. I know your media reactions go, hey, this heretic, turn it off. We don't want to listen to this no more. Cameron Jordan's number one. Hey, Cam's amazing. But Cameron Jordan's been the most dominant defensive lineman for a very good defensive line group this year. And he showcased that even more in this game. And we're going to highlight what makes him such a incredible player so far. And sure, there are still amazing guys across the line, but this guy's been really studly. Now, remember, I try to say this every time, a singular film study you might watch on YouTube, whether it be mine or somebody else's, or an article you might read is not enough to build a full scouting report. You gotta go out and do the work yourself. But hopefully this gives you an idea of how he's playing, looking at some of the good and the bad, how he can still improve, and how he's impacted the game. So, without further ado, if you wanna see more film studies on this channel, all you got to do, who that in the comment section down below. I'll see you in a few seconds. More film. I love film studies, especially after a big old win and a shutout. All right, so we're going to take a look at several different plays. We're going to start with a run fit right here. Carl Grandison being right above my head, but don't worry. I'll highlight him for those who might miss him. So is going to be number 96, lined up straight over the left tackle right here. And watch how he maintains his fit. I actually like this. One of the things I talked about him needing to get better at as he grew as a player was the ability to stack these offensive linemen and, and peak the gap and manage to you know fight and maintain control and win so he does that here he's going to slice inside you're going to notice the left tackle is going to pop out which means that granderson is going to be taking over uh, the responsibility of taking on the guard guard is never able to really get inside of his chest great initial hand placement good early punch by granderson creates some separation but at the same time, he's controlling the gap and peaking. I love this part right here because this is actually one of the things that I used to call a deficiency in Granderson's game when he first came to the Saints. The ability to defend the run. Now, he's always had tremendous speed, athletic ability. He could have, you know, he's really show good hip and ankle flex, you know, the ability to bend down and attack the arc in terms of a pass rush. But getting stronger and operating with better technique and the runs uh, were something that he needed to get better at. I think you have seen that. Here. Now, New Orleans will also do some things to put him in a great position, but plays like this are fantastic. He sneaks the outside, but created that separation. Now he's going to shed it real quick, slice back inside, and help make that tackle. Let's flip that angle around real quick and watch it from this backside. I really do think that this is an underrated part of his game, and if you want to be the best defensive lineman on this team, you've got to play more than just the pass at a high level. Now, again, to be clear, Cameron Jordan still does this at an elite level. I would say Cameron Jordan as a pass rusher has gone to becoming above average to good, not elite anymore, but he is still very good, whereas you're seeing Carl Granderson really add more to his overall set, and this is a great rep to showcase that. Great stack right there, take some head on, peak, find where the running back's at, locate ball, and once you force him, get inside, make the tackle. Very good rep, and these are the type of things that he's doing at a high level, and consistency is key. He's doing it consistently. All right, so I'm going to let you watch this. I'm going to go ahead and warn you, this one we're going to have a lot of talking to do, and that's just because there's a lot going on on both sides of the ball, and it's an opportunity to do some teach tape. So on the left side, you're going to see a very heavy front here, but this is all set up to the skies, the twist and stun. All of this is to set it up for one guy, Carl Granderson, and that leads to the interception. So, let's talk about what's going on everywhere. So you got a heavy loaded front here, A gap and double C gap with two ends. So what are we doing? The whole idea is to do an end to end stunt. What I mean by end to end is I've talked about tackle to end and end to tackle, which would, you know, the end would go first and then the tackle would loop around. Here's actually an end to end stunt because we have two guys on the outside. What we're gonna do is same thing we just said. Now, the question is, okay, well, how do we create the interior space? That's where Brian Brise comes in, or as I like to call him, Brian Breezy. I know I say it all the time. But that way you won't gripe at me in the comments section. What we're gonna do here is show him in this A-gap and then immediately push him opposite. So we're actually gonna drag him to the opposite way, and that's going to drag our offensive lineman away. Now, the big difference here for the offensive line is how are they gonna run the protection calls? Are they gonna do what's called Bob? Bob simply means big on big. So that would just mean big guy, big guy, big guy. Are they gonna do a slide protection, which would be sliding everybody down and then just simply blocking back? Are they gonna do a combo protection, which is gonna be a mix? You know, we're gonna have like zone on this side where we're blocking a gap and then big on big 
on the backside. Several things they could do, but having these varied looks makes it very difficult for an offensive line to go after you. And that's what you're going to have here. So watch as the play goes by a little slowly. We'll start with it. You're going to notice Granderson right here on the end. So you see we're making some adjustment calls and you're going to have the running back right here in the A-gap. All right, so what do we do? Number one, I talk about how we do stunts. Look at Passignon. What's he doing? He's attacking the inside, drawing in the guard, but his momentum is heading to the tackle. Look at Brze. He has now attacked the opposite A-gap. So he's already switched. His head has crossed the path of the center. And you can see the opening being created. Granderson is selling the arc run. But what he's going to do is on that second step, he's going to plant and shoot right behind the butt of Passignon. So let's unpause it real quick. Bam. See that, that second plant foot? We're cutting back inside. But now it's too late for the tackle to catch. Uh, Passignon is doing a great job to... Turn the back of the guard. The guard is fully committed to him. And now he's going to take out the tackle. And that opens up the lane right there for Carl Granderson. And while this doesn't go down for a sack, it is literally what creates the pick six for Honey Badger. And that isn't to say that Honey Badger wasn't in position or anything. Like that. It's, it's simply a great play design, but great execution across the way, right? Like everybody has to do their job really well here for this to be effective. You got to have the rookie... Three tech get across the opposite a gap immediately you got to have your interior guy who we're passing you on do a great job to sell that interior rush and really get that guard to commit and then you got to have quickness and great ability to shift directions fast in granderson so you could ride that butt and come inside on this b gap and then pressure the quarterback fantastic job the guard cannot react to pick up the stunt the tackle is put into no man's land and this is a chef's kiss moment of how to run this and you can only do this with very good defensive linemen you got to have guys who are quick on their feet guys who understand timing and guys who are strong enough to get these linemen out of their way great job by everybody and even though this is a carl granderson film study you can see how defensively this is a very very good unit all right told you that was gonna be a long one next Hey, Saints fans, just want to remind you, if you want to support the channel, because we can't make film studies and do the podcast that you love without support from the amazing Houdat Nation, check out our merch store. It's RevDeuce.com, and we've got hoodies, we've got hats. I'm actually wearing the white on white one right now because I think it's beautiful. Mugs, t-shirts, and more, including the famous Pull the Trigger t-shirt, which everybody tends to love. It, it's amazing, right? We love aggressive play calling. So if you want to check out the channel, support the channel, RevDeuce.com. Hope you enjoy the rest of the film study, and I'll see you, well, in a few seconds, but probably wearing something different. Crazy how the internet works. So I love this one. I'll give you a little bit of preview. Look at him bouncing left to right. What's he doing here? Well, he's, he's messing with the blocking scheme because he's not letting it be known what exactly is his responsibility when it comes to what gap he's in charge of. Why does that matter, you might ask? Well, this is what's called a pin and pull block by the Patriots. So the idea is the tight end right above me, right here, the tight end wants to pin the defensive end down. So he wants to pin them this way, and then we're gonna pull the tackle, and we're gonna pull over here. We're gonna try to pull two guys out. So pin and pull. So pin down and then pull out around it. You wanna attack the outside here. So what does Granderson do? Now, one thing that New Orleans does a lot of is called scrape exchange, where they'll have Granderson responsible for the interior, and then they'll give the outside uh, to the linebacker. But here, Granderson's playing a little bit of a, well, where's my job? Am I going inside? Am I going outside? Am I going inside? Am I going outside? And then not only does he <laughs> put in that little bit of confusion, because if he has outside, the tackle should be getting him. If he has inside, the tight end should be getting him. But then he does a great job to do what we said before. He's going to engage, stack, peak, shed. Now he's in no man's land all by himself. The only person he's got to worry about is getting rid of that other puller. What does he do? Attack it. Use his speed. We don't need to take him head on because we're faster. We're quick. We have better short area awareness. And then big old mauling TFL. Fantastic. And again, this is how he's come, uh, come and become, in my opinion, the best defensive lineman on the team. And that's not to shade... Cameron Jordan, by the way. I still believe Cameron Jordan is a very good player. If you watch the tape of this game, even though we're not focusing on Cam, he has a good game. Cam is not washed. He's not a slouch. Just that is how much Carl Granderson has grown in the past few years. And he's really taken to another level right now. There's a reason he's on pace for double-digit sacks. And even though Cameron Jordan leads the team in pressures, 
Carl Granderson has now become a very stout, very solid guy on the opposite side. Now, he's not perfect. There are definitely things that he can improve on. But in terms of things like this, these are the ways that if you need to give a visual to a fan, how has Granderson gotten better? This right here. By the way, Colin Saunders, who I continually show love to as a one tech. People need to understand how good Colin, I mean, he's playing a two eye here, but how good Colin Saunders is. Oh, look at that long arm. Get in that inside shoulder, then get rid of him, baby. Oh, big man moving, big man moving. Oh, this defensive line is good. Oh, God, it's so good to watch football when it's good football and it's a win. Sorry, guys, I'm getting too excited. Next. Now, because I don't do hype videos and I don't do highlight videos, let's show you some of the things that he is still working on. He's not a perfect product and he's not the best defensive end in the league. Let's talk about some of the ways that he can get better. Now, he loves to rush the arc. He has a variety of moves. You see him use a double swipe. We've seen him use the ghost move in the past. I would love him to add a fake spin, but he has a real spin move. He's done a two-arm bull rush, a one-arm bull rush. He is certainly a player that has grown and developed as a pass rusher, but he loves to run up the arc. And when we talk about running up the arc, that means from his position in this wide nine, he's trying to basically where I am, he's trying to get around the edge, right? He's trying to capture that edge and then flatten out and then get to Mac Jones. I almost said Daniel Jones, but Mac Jones. So one thing that he does struggle with at times is an effective inside stab. What I mean by that is, this is where the offensive lineman, one, he's dedicated, he's going to uh, parallel to Jones here, but he's going to use his length and power, pop that shoulder. Watch how it throws Granderson off. Boop. Little things like that. It, it completely stalled him. So why is that important? So the number one thing that I think Granderson still has to improve on is how does he fight length? And we talk about, and we've heard it before, you know, great defensive ends, length doesn't matter. But for some defensive ends, it does, especially when you're working your way up to being elite. And that's kind of what Granderson's doing right behind me. If you can see right there, that inside punch has got him and it's throwing him off. And all he has to do is get better with timing. He's got to be quicker to the punch. He has to see this coming. And there's ways to avoid it. You can flash the hand, which is a move that you'll see tackles use. A flash simply means that we're going to throw out the hand. So this is our, our little... Little guy right there, he's just going to flash the hand instead of committing it, we're just going to flash it, and that is going to get the offensive lineman to sell his move or try to commit early. And you do see Granison do that in this game. But he's still got to combat this because it's actually going to affect him two plays in a row. So you have this play and literally the next rep. Let me fast forward for you. See that stab working on that inside shoulder? Next rep, you're going to see the same thing happen. He's got to work on combating that length, whether it's with – you know, a forklift technique, whether it's just simply using the ghost move to slip underneath it. Either way, he's got to find ways to better fight against that inside stab of length and use that to his advantage. If he knows that guys are going to be using their inside arm to come in at him, he can either break inside, which he's attempting here, but doesn't fully uh, master. He doesn't fully break into the inside, or he needs to find another way to dip through it, whether it be a dip underneath, a rip. There's a lot of things that he can do, and he is a guy that I see, when these moves are effective, you don't see him losing like three or four reps in a row. He's going to find some counter to provide, and he just gets caught here. And that happens, right? Even the elites are not going to win every rep. And he is a guy that I've seen a lot of improvement from, but this is something that got him multiple times in this game. Eventually, he did start to adapt and get better against it, which is something to note if you're watching this in the future. I mean, if you're wanting to see has he improved from that? Well, maybe in four or five weeks, we look back and say, hey, this left tackle tried to do the same thing against him, and he beat it, right? We'll just have to wait and see. Next. All right, so we've seen that stab be effective. What do we do to counter it? We're going to counter right here. How? We're going to go up field arc, and then we're going to step hardcore in. So what we're doing is, in this one, we're actually taking away the ability to hit us with that stab. How? Well, we're going up field at a direct line. So we're rushing up field. What we're doing is, I'm going to write it right next to it. So we're going straight down and then breaking in. So what does this do? So if you're rushing at, say, a 45-degree angle, so you're going at this angle, it's easier to get that initial stab in for the offensive lineman on our shoulder. So what do we do? Take away that space that they can use to get that arm in. And that way we can get lined up. So remember how I talk about an offensive lineman likes to play half man? Well, that's part of what you're doing. You're attacking one side and then driving them out. Well, now we're going to make sure that they have to play us man up. 
And that's what he does here. By taking that initial step downfield and then breaking inside, what he's done is open it up to where he can now come in with a bull rush, which is exactly what you're going to see right here. Bam. You see, he shoots his hands, he gets them in first, and now he's attacked the chest of the left tackle. So again, you see an offensive lineman attacking you one way, we see that they're effective, can he counter? Well, a few plays later, actually this is the next drive, he does counter. We go upfield, we break in, so we've removed that space that he can use to get that one arm in on us, and now we're going after him. And you also see that offensive lineman's called for help. So we got that guard doing what's called looking for work. So even though that guard had an initial assignment right there, I'm sorry, the center comes over and says, hey, I want to help him out. Been having some problems right there. And that's part of what being a good defensive end is going to do. You're going to start garnering more attention. But what happens if you find out the way they want to fight you and you find out how to beat it and then you win? All right, so here we go. This is another drive. Again, we know that they're coming with that one arm stab. So what do we do? We got you. We're going to beat it. And in fact, he's going to do something a little bit different than he did before. This time, he's going right back to that 45 rush. In terms of he's going to run the arc, but he's going at a 45 degree angle. So he's not cutting upfield and then breaking back, coming straight at it. But what do we do now? Well, we've already shown several different things to this offensive lineman right here. Let's change it up. Now, we're going to beat him to the punch. So at this point, this is what you call a pass rush plan, where we're layering moves at different points of the game to get them to not know what's coming. Like, we want to confuse them mentally to where they can't predict how we're going to rush them. And a talented defensive lineman can do this, and he can also set up later moves. Cameron Jordan does the same thing, by the way. It's actually what Cameron Jordan is doing on the opposite side, and it's why he wins. But we're not talking about Cam today. As far as Granderson, he sold this. And now that he's given certain looks, and he knows what the left tackle is doing, he can counter it. The key is, the left tackle's not changing. Left tackle's trying to do the same thing. 45 set. Inside staff, trying to play half man. Cool, I know what you're doing, so what do I do? I'm gonna beat you with the same thing. Because he shows a, the two-arm rush, but all he's doing is a one-arm stab and then he breaks away real quick. So, as an offensive lineman, when you're trying to engage, you wanna get hands on and you're naturally gonna have that momentum and you're gonna be on their body, you're, you're gonna be moving with them, right? Like you're trying to move into them and hold them there and anchor down. But what he does essentially is he's going to do just enough to throw him off. And the best way I can describe this, and I would love if another, you know, a former defensive lineman maybe, or pro defensive lineman comes and talk about it. Tell me what you think about this analogy. But how it was always for me is the best way is think of boxing. If you ever have done any boxing, you know, when a, a punch is coming your way, you're not actually trying to like punch it out the way. All you're doing is tapping it. So what happens if that punch is coming to my face, if I tap it, it just throws it off course just a little bit. I'm not trying to full on move it and redirect it. I just want to pop, move it out the way. Pop, move it out the way. Or actually like this. We want to pop it down. Just tapping it. Just want to throw it off course a little bit. And that's all this is doing. He's simply going to get to the spot first, throws them off just a little bit. It throws off his momentum. It creates just that little bit of space to do this right here. Come underneath. Flatten down. All he did is beat him to the spot, hit him first just enough, but he didn't fully engage in a bull rush. So... This left tackle has seen several things. He's seen a 45 degree kind of angle from a wide nine up the arc. He's seen a power step, break in, bull rush. So this tackle has been shown several different looks now. What exactly are we going to face? Well, what you're going to face this time is just enough to throw you off. You think you have it. And he changes the game, drops the arm, and goes around you. That is one of the reasons that I look at Granderson and I go, he's gone next level. I can't say that he is Miles Garrett level good yet because Miles Garrett is scary. You know, the, the Bosa's and stuff like that are, are fantastic. What, uh, right? The TJ Watts. I can tell you that Granderson, in terms of what he was before and what he is now, operates with a pass rush plan. Certainly has great play strength. Operates with high end play speed. I'd even say elite play speed for the position. And he's certainly become a well-rounded individual. So that you can have plays like this on critical third downs where he has sold and shown certain moves throughout the day and the the effective pass rush plan by the way if there's one way that he can get better look at this get off compared to cam's get off that's that's an elite veteran right there who knows snap timing and get off so just a slight difference there but the key to a pass rush plan is yes you want every rep to win but you also want to be setting up that opponent to where they don't know what you're going to hit them with so that you can change it up later in the game. So in the second quarter right now, when you need a key 
you know, third down sack, you can beat him to the spot, flash that arm, do just enough to throw him off balance. Just give him that tap on the inside and then break through underneath him. Throws him. Beautiful. Good stuff. All right, back here in a run defense slot. And normally, let me go ahead and pause it. Normally in this situation, especially the look the defense is giving, you would have him responsible for this outside gap. He'd have the containment role if it was a backside play. He'd be responsible for the C gap here. But what New Orleans likes to do a lot of times, especially to take advantage of the power and the violence that Granderson can play with, is run what's called scrape exchange. Now, I've shown this before, but I'm going to show it again. The whole idea is normally this would be his gap. This would be the interior. Linebacker would have this gap. And we would just, you know, depending on how we want to do it, we could attack inside or we could, you know, actually swap it out and have him here and him here and him here. However you want to do it, there's several different ways. But we're focusing on this opposite side. It's going to be right here and here. But anyway, again, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> scrape exchange, the whole idea is the linebacker scrapes, just as the word would imply, scrapes outside, and you have exchanged the gap, so you're going to attack inside. And it definitely throws the tackle for a little bit of a loop here. So, bam, cuts inside, tackle is not expecting, especially the look Granderson's given. Because remember, the Granderson <laughs> that you're seeing here is lined up wide. Like, he is showing that he has that responsibility. But the key is, you can't just show this and break inside, because he makes it look easy. But the truth is, this is explosion this is very very good to be able to cross that much distance beat through and then come through and flatten out and get that huge tfl this is what i talk about him just have reaching another level in a positive way again i can't say that carl granderson is the best defensive end in the nfl that's not the argument i'm making what i am saying is that he's become very very good and he's not a player that just has these really wide wow that's an issue that he has to fix in his game. He doesn't have these massive gaps or holes in his game. He's gotten better. It helps that he's got a defense that's playing to his strengths. His strength, honestly, is not containment. Now, he has to do that. You can't run scrape exchange all the time. You've got to be able to contain. And I do think that as a backside player, he can still get better. But you're taking advantage of his quickness, his power, and his explosiveness, and you're fighting him inside. And then, of course, you got a linebacker like Demario Davis. You know that the play is going to be run well, and it's going to end up working. Now, every now and then, this is a problem. Last week, he actually missed this. So they had, looks like they had run scrape exchange, but both him and Pete Warner ended up in this outside gap, and nobody took the inside gap, and it led to a big run by Tampa Bay. So again, he's not perfect. Things are getting better. But when it, things go right, like when things are done perfectly, technically sound, this is what you get. He's going to cross about three yards across the face's tackle, break inside, and then you've got Demario Davis flowing to the outside already. This is just... Again, another chef's kiss play, playing fundamentally well across all three levels of his defense. And Granderson up the front is certainly making a case for him. He's the best, at, at least for the Saints. Moving on, I want to end it with one more pass rush here from a wide nine. Just honestly, because he gave me the Junior Gallette stance, I was like, you know what? We're going to play it. So we've got Junior Gallette stance, that four-pointer here from what's called a wide nine. Wide nine would simply just be if there was a tight end right here. He's on the outside of the tight end. That's what the wide nine alignment. It's just a nine technique where you would have like a three technique over here. And Cam also coming out wide. So what I love here is you're just seeing more moves from him in a win. Even though this doesn't get to the quarterback, they've, they've switched quarterbacks at this point. They're doing quick passes. But he's going to get off. I love the get off here. He is trying to work that snap count. A little bunny hop here, and he's going to attack that elbow. Your aiming point for this double swipe is that outside elbow. You want to collapse it down and then get past him. Exactly what it does here. Right, flatten out. Now, again, they're running quick passing to try to, you know, stymie this pressure that's been getting to them all day. So it doesn't go anywhere. But it does force an incomplete pass because the quarterback doesn't have the opportunity to get the ball where it needs to go. And again, just different things. You've shown this tackle things all day long. You're deep into the game, showing something you haven't before. And that's what a good player can do. And you won the rep. So... Gosh, he's, he looks good. So I hope you enjoyed the video, Saints fans. I really am impressed with how much Carl Granderson has grown. And I know I've made it a point, like in the video, to, to not overcommit and say he's the best defensive end in the NFL because I don't watch all the defensive ends in the NFL. And I don't want to be one of those guys who just says something based off a snap, you know, I'll see or, or some great play. But what I can say is I do believe he's probably the best defensive lineman you have, even though I still see 
Cameron Jordan consistently winning. Even though Brian Brzee is looking fantastic, even though Colin Saunders is doing way better than I've seen a one-tech do consistently through five games in New Orleans in a while. He is simply just standing out, and this was a great game for him. And I'm curious if anybody else is seeing the same thing. Like, when you go back and watch the games, are you seeing him play at a high level? Are you seeing the, you know, the, the things on tape where he's doing things at a clip that you're just not used to? And honestly, come let me know in my Discord, link in the description of his video, what you think about Carl Granderson. As a player, he's certainly grown. And as a player, it seems to be no doubt why the New Orleans Saints chose him to be the starter Obviously, Cameron Jordan. No offense to Peyton Turner and no offense to the rookie, Bosky. Man's just good. Who that? God bless. Deuces, that's me. Catch you in the next video, next podcast. Appreciate every single one of you. I'm out.